what I want to do at this point is make it easier for me to update these classes. The, the way it works now, I have to manually plug in these values to do the update. I would like that I click on this row, it fills itself in, and then I just change what I want and hit update. So let's actually make this kind of cool. Let's back up to where we built our table. And let's add a new field for an icon, like a little edit pencil. We don't have jQuery mobile, but we still have the ability to reference these, these built-in ASCII graphics, and one is a pencil. So we need to go back where we built our table. That's back on lines 66 or so, uh, 65. We're going to create a new column, one final column at the end that will have little pencils. And so, and so the, um, that means on line 65, I need to create a new TH, a new table heading. So make sure at about line 65 where you're building that new row, At the end, after instructor, we'll add a new th. That column will be our column for editing. We could write the word edit, but I just want an empty space there. So we have the empty space. Non breaking space. We have the non breaking space symbol that will create an empty character because we know that if we press simply the space bar that really won't render as a space but we have the empty space character in HTML this is non-breaking space it's a space so we're gonna create a brand new heading a brand new column right there you don't have to check it but to see how it looks like it'll be like this we'll have a brand new space there non-breaking space and what each of those rows will be filled with is we will create a new we've got we've got the ID we've got the title we've got the inst we need to add a new one before the end of before the end of the line there do the same thing as before where we close the previous TD and add a new TD This is a little bit different. We're not really going to need to pull anything out of the database. So I'm going to stay within the quotes right there. Oh, before I forget, uh, at the end of that line, a plus. I'm going to stay within the quotes because what I want to display on screen is an ASCII character. We've got one after I looked it up. There's one uh, ampersand pound 270E. Um, semicolon that should create a little pencil like we had back with jQuery mobile data roll equals pencil or whatever it creates a pencil here's like the old school way to do it without jQuery jQuery mobile
Hmm. Did anyone get that pencil to appear on the right column? What's that? What is it? What is it? Just code? Yes. Didn't render? But you do get a new column there? Yes. Huh. Did, did people get a column? Maybe the wrong thing, but did you get a column? Huh. So is my code right? TH, TH, I'm not getting a new column. TH, 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 TH. No, that's a good point. Oh, yeah. Beginner mistake. We all make them. PSP. <laughs> Put that back. Yep, so always check. I get, yeah, some weird code. That is supposed to be a little pencil. Should be a zero because we're dealing with hexadecimal. So it's a zero. All right, let me confirm something here. This whole, and let me reveal one of my tricks here. This whole thing that we've been doing, if you'd like to look at it yourself, a version of it is over here. If you go look at vmcinc.net slash blog slash pouch db dash intro, I think that's what I called it. Yeah. If you go look at this, this is a version of what we're doing right now in class. I guess this is a shorter address. vmcinc.net slash pouch db dash intro. This is a blog post about what we are doing here. Let me just double check my code here because I don't have it on my printout. But what we're doing here is a variation in Notepad. Yeah, type uh, 49s. No semicolon? Yes. Sir. Weird. Because I've got some my example code here. Huh. See in my example code, which I've double checked. Oh, I actually have a capital E. That might matter right there. I have lowercase x, uppercase E. Or 1000. Yeah, so we can look up all of these possible ones. That's, that's a different pencil right That's the one I was going for. So you can put 9999, or you can put what I meant here was capital E. So this is hexadecimal, and then 270 capital E. And that gives you a, diff, a, a kind of a pencil. Or we can do uh, ampersand, pound, 9999. It's another pencil. Again, that's why jQuery Mobile is so nice. Icon equals pencil. The end. And here we have to know the number. Although we have different pencils that we can play with. Now also, uh, well, we'll do that one in a moment. So anyway, this, builds a, this should build a column. You've got a pencil. So the concept is you click the pencil. It automatically fills in your fields. So then, then you can easily edit them. So that means we need to create a function in order for that to happen, in order for these pencils to be clickable, to be active. So we'll scroll down. What you should have is that you do have a new column with a pencil, any pencil. 
and um, we've got our whole block from about line 100. I've got the update class block. What I want to do is create a function before it called um, prep, you know, edit, prep edit classes, prepare to edit the classes. I want to do it before this function because I want those fields filled in for me before I try to um, edit the existing text. So let's back up before our whole block of update class. I'm going to give myself some space there. And the same as before, I'm going to have some jQuery selector. Same as before, we've got div results. We've got that placeholder. <coughs> that placeholder div. It's going to need to be clicked on. We'll do it this way first. In quote, quotes, tr. tr is table row, so I'm saying click on that row and then allow us to grab the data that's in that row to, to work with. Comma function. We will have here update class prep. This is a function that will first prepare us to be able to update the class easily. And the way this will work is, based on what's already been typed here, when you click the pencil, fill these boxes in. In order for that to work, we have to then further specify what are we going to click on to, um, for this to work. We're going to use the keyword of, of this. I'll explain why in a moment, but we're going to have here We're going to use this in the parentheses. We're going to pass in. We're going to pass in the. Um, the object. Dollar parentheses this. And at the end of that, dot parent method. So dollar parentheses this. Um, that is a way to reference the thing that we've clicked on. I've clicked on this. Let's reference it. It has a variety of properties, like width and height, background color, all of that. So basically, that whole object can be referenced via this. And so, well, I'm mixing up two different ones. So take away the parent. We'll do parent in just a moment. This might be an easier way for the moment. So what we're saying is we're going to click on this row. TR is row. We're going to click on this row. This row that we clicked on is full of all of this data that we then want to get and put into these boxes. So that's why we have we have the this object right here. Store all of that data temporarily and pass it into next line, pass it into the function that we're defining, update class prep. Um, this obj, this object, this is similar to when we were working with that JSON practice in that we had the XML object. Remember when we connected from our HTML file to the JSON file? We basically stored a reference to it in an, in an object so that we can reference this XML data. So this object, whatever the particular row that you've clicked on, we're storing it in this, we're passing it into the function, this object, and then we can reference it. We'll create some variables here again, var dollar temp crn equals this obj, this object, dot 
find dot text what we're saying here is technically which we will refine in a moment technically our code says uh, click anywhere in this table row so if I click on the pencil anywhere in the row I want to find what the CRN was typed. I want to find what the class of this object is. I want to find what the instructor of this object is. If I were to click on the one down here, this would have this CRN and this class and this instructor. So each of these is separated into its own field. I want to get the text that's in the field. But which field? I've got four to deal with. The CRN field, the class field, the instructor field, and then the edit pencil field. So with find, we're going to specify which of those possible fields we're talking about. In quotes, we're going to say TD, table data. Well, I'm talking about one of the cells, colon, EQ, parentheses, zero. I'm talking about the zero width. I'm saying find the cell that equals the first one, the zero width one. Give me its text. Store it in this variable. comma, because we've also got temporarily the name of the class, same way, this object, find its text, which specific object, it's td equals 1. That's the second item in the row, uh, eq, yes, eq equals this. Thank you. And eq, not ed. This object, this cell, which equals 1, which is the second item in, in the row. Give me that text, which should be whatever they wrote. One more. temp inst is this object find something. Give me its text, end of line, semicolon. And the something is, in quotes, it's a particular cell that is equal to the second, or actually the third in the sequence. Put it into the variable. To see if this is working, little console output. Nothing too pretty. My concept is I want to be able to click on each of those rows. Wherever I click, show that data that exists in the console. This is um, this is this is the beauty of jQuery. That is jQuery dot find. That's jQuery. Uh, that's a jQuery method that helps us. That works because we write less, we do more. The specification of jQuery lets us do this. With plain old JavaScript, we'd have to write very complex if-else statements and such to match what we're looking for. With jQuery, it's dot .find and then specifically a cell that equals this one within the sequence. Zero with first, second. So the way this should work, if it works, is that is that oh, this should be I got my curly braces and such here
What's that? Oh, yes. All right. Okay, so I'm supposed to be able to click then on those rows and not very pretty, but it's going to show me the data on each of those rows. You know, I click on the pencil. In this one, I've got 999 Android 2 Smith. And that's what I see here, 999 Android 2 Smith. No special spacing and such because I didn't program that. At the very least, though, I'm clicking on a row. It's sh finding that data, displaying it on screen. That's what all of this is doing. Wherever I've clicked, so that's coming from this. Wherever I've clicked, find the cell equal to whatever in the sequence get its text displayed on displayed in the console okay if we're able to capture and display the text well then the point of that is that we want to fill the those input boxes that are waiting for us little copy and paste here remember the those input boxes updates here in input box I can copy that the val is the temp CRN that those input boxes are empty I've just stored whatever the what whatever is in that row in a variable. And then in that input box now, its value will be set to what was in that row. So we've got temp name. Inst. So the purpose of update class prep is to make it a little easier of a, for us. You click on a row, you capture the data that's already on screen, and then populate those input fields, these, these input fields, with whatever those variables are temporary ho temporarily holding. So uh, let's see, I show classes, I click on the first row, populated the fields. Click on the next one, populate the fields, I click on that one. So I'm clicking on a particular row, it populates those fields. So if I do an update, it will update two out of the three ones. Notice uh, I want to update class XYZ, so I'll fill it up. Actually, it wasn't XYZ. It was XYZ2. Do an update. The CRN XYZ2 doesn't exist. We're trying to update a class XYZ2 that doesn't exist, so this is a limitation here. We are able to update two out of the three fields. We cannot update IDs. Pouch doesn't have a way for us to easily update IDs. We could though, logically, perhaps by temporarily storing the data of a document, 
then when the person is trying to edit that one, we create a new document with the new ID and delete the old ID all behind the scenes because there is no way to, do, to update the ID directly. Perhaps what we could do is not even allow this field to be edited. If we're not even able to edit the ID, we need to have an ID here in order to update the other fields. We have two here, but we're going to have seven fields. So we cannot edit the ID field. What we could do is uh, we could make this ID, we can make this field hidden, or I believe there's an HTML5 attribute that we can add to a field to make it disabled. Let's see, HTML5 disable uh, input. Simply disabled, okay. Input disabled. Disabled equals disabled. Hmm. Okay, let's check that one. Simply disabled. Um, when we're building our input fields up here, input type. Let's see if I just add disabled. I can't edit it, but if I click on it, it does fill it in. I cannot edit that, but I can edit these things. Do let me edit. That's again not a perfect solution. That's one solution up to our level of knowledge at the moment. Seems kind of useful and cool. So what I did was um, I backed up to line uh, 77, where we were creating our input field, our input type text placeholder one two three update CRN ID. That's our input field to input the the ID number. Simply adding the attribute disabled, which is weird because usually we have something equals something. But anyway, after update CRN, single quote, before the end of the tag, space disabled. And with HTML5, it understands, okay, this field is visible, but it's disabled. You can't do anything with it. No problem, because we're clicking the pencil to auto-populate the field. We need that field populated because that CRN lets us edit an existing document. But I don't want the person then to change it because the, now it's a new document and we can't edit a non-existing document. So that does this. Now we can't do it ourselves manually. We have to click, the user has to click on the pencil. These things populate. Update. CRN is not touched. I shouldn't touch CRN, really. Unless, like I said, again, we temporarily hold the old CRN, make a new document, put that in, delete the old document, all behind the scenes, then show the result with show classes, and that's sort of like updating the CRN, although technically internally it's creating a new ID. Technically also, notice anywhere that you click on the row, it auto-populates the field, not just the pencil. Any of these rows triggers populating the fields. I really just wanted that the pencil triggers the populating of the fields. To put that final bit of polish and then we'll wrap up We've got this, line 100, we're saying, there's that div, click on any row of that table, click any table row for this to work. Well, in order for only the pencil to work, we need to rewrite our code a little bit. We need to have um, a particular cell clicked on, but we've got 
many cells that we could possibly click on. All of these is a cell. That would be the same thing as TR. I want to click on this specific cell. So perhaps if we add a class to the cells, remember if you thought of an ID, that can only be used once. If we add a class to each of these pencils and then target our code so that it only is triggered by clicking that cell, which is named by that class, we can do that. So let's back up to where we created the cell. That was back on line 70. That's where I put the pencil. There's that cell td slash td. We'll add a class. Add an ID because we cannot reuse the ID. Class equals, we'll call it edit pencil. Class edit pencil. There's a pencil. That cell now has a unique identifier. Only the rightmost column of cells has the unique identifier for us to then refine line 100 instead of tr, any, anything in that row. Now it's going to be dot edit pencil because it's a class. So now specifically those cells, the edit pencil cell is the active target to run the function. Because I already have the code set up, this is still won't quite work because now this messes up with our this. By saying tr, this was the object of the whole row, tr. And therefore, the zeroth cell of the whole row would work. The first cell of the whole row would work. Now we're, we're starting deeper within the um, hierarchy. Now we're starting in a cell, so this is just this cell. This cell doesn't have any table row, any TDs. So we have to add one more thing to our code so that we reference again the whole row. We've got dollar parentheses this. That's inside of the parentheses of update class. Between the parentheses of this and the parentheses of update class, we'll add dot parent parentheses. This is another bit of jQuery. It's a jQuery, I believe it's a jQuery um, method. Parent, because we have child and parent elements, you know, we have the whole body element inside of it, our children elements. If we've got a table inside of the table, we've got cells which are children of the table. And what I've done with this is I've clicked on one cell. Well, I want to reference the parent. The parent is the row. So reference all of the data, the parent of what I've currently clicked on. I've currently clicked on the one cell of edit pencil. So this like backs up and puts then the whole row. This then should continue to work. Now we have cells to work with again. Individual cells. <coughs> I'm clicking on anything in the CRN, it ignores it. I'm clicking anything in the class, it ignores it. Instructor ignores it. Click the pencil, it didn't ignore it. Because now the pencil cells have a class. And it should still populate everything because of parent. If you don't have parent, it'll get all confused. Without parent, nothing, because there's no cells in there. There's no TDs in the TD. We're now clicking anywhere besides the pencil of its particular row. Now it works just the pencil, and it populates the field, and that's an update. I still have to type in manually XYZ to delete. I think that's okay, because delete, that's rather permanent, unless I, of course, program more. So it's a little cumbersome here. 
to delete that one that I never really wanted. I have to do it manually. As we wind down, um, we started to do all of these functions of a real database, right? Now we've had the ability to delete data, modify data, retrieve data, save data. It's text data, but it could be any form of data. And again, we spent this time. The computer doesn't know what you want until you program it exactly with what you want. And we saw the stumbling blocks here and there. That obviously in my app I just tap it and I delete it I swipe it and it deletes it that of course is all programmed to be able to do all of that we've got a version of those things at the moment which can further be re refined but uh, here's what we've got so far so any general questions about what we've done so far before we break for the final lab time general questions Yes. So all that data though, yeah, once we close out of it, it's gone, right? And, uh, we go, what do we be using for JSON to store that data like that? Official database that you can see? No. Um, the data is going to be erased if you turn off your computer. The data is still there if I if I bring up my browser again, you know, it's still all there. But it will go away once we turn off the computer. Now, when we get it to the app it'll still be permanent in the app without putting it into a JSON file, which we could. Uh, it'll still be permanent in the app because the app will be installed, the person will have the app, the data won't go away. If the person deletes the app, then the data will delete. Pouch has the ability, if we had the infrastructure, to replicate all of this data to a server. That would then be a way for that data to be even more permanent because we're just thinking in terms of the web browser, it's going to go away. But once we get it to the app, it's not going to go away until they delete the app. And if we wanted to save this to a JSON file, we would have to write, you know, a few more dozen hundred lines of code, and then that'll work. So, so far we've got this up to 136 lines of code, and this is just the pouch stuff that we haven't added back to our project. So you see, this stuff can add up. So we'll wrap up and I'll put my code, my latest version of the code, in the folder. When we come back next time, we'll talk about integrating this project into our, into our app, what we need to deal with when we put it in, into that, and um, we're going to get back to our app. So bring your devices next time. Next time we're going to start to set up ourselves up again with our, with our driver and all of that and then we'll start to integrate this into our project. So that's it for the moment. We'll do a little lab time. My code is in the folder now. It's got today's date without temp. And, and that's it. So we'll do it again Thursday.